mid-November 2022, a Forbes researcher or Forbes journalist, Laura Shin, contacted me and told me that she had discovered that supposedly another Austrian, I'm from Austria, that's why she contacted me, called Toby Hunisch, was supposed one of the largest hacks in blockchain history. He was said to have stolen $11 billion and wanted to interview me what additional information I could share on that matter. On February 22, 2022, she released that article and it caused ripples, not only in the entire blockchain ecosystem, but in the entire investment and further in the entire uh, financial ecosystem. With that article, I had a lot of feedback from friends and family. Obviously, some of them also knew Toby Hunish and others just wanted to know if I could imagine him doing this hack. There were basically two questions. Those that understood what a DAO or decentralized autonomous organization was, what Web3 was, what an ICO was, what blockchain smart contracts were, these people just wanted to know if I could imagine him doing that. And I could. But then there was a way larger group. It was those people who knew him, but they didn't understand what a DAO was, what Web3 was, what a smart contract, Ethereum, and all these exciting new terms were. And so I had to explain this to them. And in this talk today, I want to do exactly the same thing. I want to give you a glimpse into this exciting world of Web3. I want to talk about the building blocks, not so much about the Bitcoin that probably many of you have heard or Ethereum and other cryptocurrency that you have heard, but I want to talk about what is decentralized finance? What are non-fungible tokens? What is Web3 in connection to decentralized autonomous organization? What is the metaverse? And we're going to dive in and take a look into all these ideas. We're going to talk about what about them is just a fad? What is just hype? What is just fiction so that companies or startups can sell you an idea that don't have much real world use case? And I'm going to talk to you about what are actual functions and facts and what are the future in this world. So let's get started with Web1. Web1 is something that all of us probably have used extensively. We're using it right now. Web1 is the internet where we are users and we pay to use it. In various countries, you have different providers, AOL and so on. Today, a lot of the internet works on our phones. So we pay a service fee to access the World Wide Web. This started in the 1990s, so over 30 years ago, and it has become ubiquitous in our life. This developed into Web2. And Web2 is the entire networking, the social media aspect of things. Here, we don't pay to use these services we actually become the product. We become the product by us creating content. So it's not using as much anymore, it's actually creating. We are interacting and other advertisers pay to get access to this data. This is what started in the 2000s and it has been with us over the past 15 to 20 years with its good and its bad days. Now, we have seen over the past 10 years a new trend emerging and that is that of Web3. And Web3 is all about owning. So it's not only about using and creating where then other companies own our data, it is us owning in the digital realm. And this is quite complicated because owning normally always requires a centralized counterparty. It needs an internet company, it needs a social media company, it needs a, a research company, it needs someone who actually owns this data. But in Web3, it is us owning all this. Now, how does this work? Well, the key term here is blockchain. Anything in Web3 needs blockchain underlying because in a blockchain, it is you who owns your own data. And this is what in 2014, eight years ago, got me into this space. I was a medical doctor and I was trying to find out how could we have medical data being owned by the patients themselves without having to trust anyone. Over the past eight years, this actually dragged me way more into the financial system because this was just the system that was very flourishing. One key aspect of blockchain, and most people always think about blockchain is about ownership and owning everything yourself in the digital world. There's a very important aspect to it that people tend to forget. Blockchain is actually mostly about proving that you do not own something anymore. When I say this, people are always a bit confused, but imagine it this way. 
If you send a WhatsApp picture to someone, you still have the picture and the other person has the picture. So who has the original now? Well, you could say, I own the original, but there's no way to prove for you to have the original if the other person also has the WhatsApp picture. And that is completely different in the blockchain space. In a blockchain space, you can prove that you transferred something to someone else which means the other person can prove that he or she has the original. And this is the absolute essential part. It's not so much about owning. It's actually proving that you transferred ownership over. And this will be a very decisive part in all the various use cases that we're going to talk about in Web3. Now, obviously, I want to start with the fad question. Is this legit? Is this just hype? Is this just fad? If you go on the internet, you will see both sides of the story. You will have companies and platforms who will tell you that Web3 is the next big revolution. And then you will have other participants, very famous ones. Elon Musk, CEO of Tesla, Jack Dorsey, uh, ex-CEO of Twitter, co-founder of Twitter, who talk about Web3 just being this hype created by more venture capitalists who want to make money off all that. And so that's why they are performing a stunt by pushing this narrative. And then you have people who are very, very excited about it and tell you that this is going to be the next thing. And we're going to talk about companies like Meta from ex-Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg. You probably have seen and heard a lot about his ambitions to transition Facebook or Meta into the metaverse. And so who to trust, who to believe? Well, anything, Web 1, Web 2, and probably also Web 3, all started with very questionable, maybe not as straightforward use cases. For example, the very early internet was mainly used for two things. It was mainly used for porn and online gambling, the two vices that drew a lot of people out of the meat space into the online space. Now, there's nothing wrong with these two use cases, but also 30 years ago, people mostly said the internet won't be used for anything meaningful or useful other than porn and online gambling. Well, and we know what turned out of that over the past 30 years. If we look at the very first use case of Web3, which is Bitcoin, we actually saw a very, very simple or similar behavior over the past 10 years. Bitcoin, a digital censorship resistant asset, was mainly used at the beginning for illicit use cases. It was used to bypass payments for illegal use cases. For example, here's Silk Road, an online platform where people could buy and sell drugs. Bitcoin was the main form of payment because nothing else would work there, obviously, because this was illegal. And so people have predicted 10 years ago that Bitcoin would only be used for these illegal use cases, and there was nothing to it. Well, forward 10 years, last year, less than 0.15% of all Bitcoin transactions were actually illicit. And if you compare that to regular dollar transactions that are in the regular percentages, this is just a fraction of illegal use cases. And today, Bitcoin has completely transitioned out of the idea that it would only get used for such illicit behavior. And today, actually, when you look at when does Bitcoin use spike, not the speculation, not just the pure investment, but you actually look at the use case, then you see that this mostly happens in countries where there's war, where there's geopolitical conflicts, where there's extremely high inflation, and people need to protect their wealth, especially when they travel, when they move somewhere. It's a lot easier to travel and move something digitally and not need to carry any physical goods with them. And we see this over the past couple of years. It doesn't matter if we're talking about Syria, Venezuela, Turkey, right now in the Ukraine and so on. And so Bitcoin has completely moved out of these illicit use cases 10 years ago, questionable use cases 10 years ago, into an actual asset today. The term that over the past couple of years you may have heard is that of decentralized finance. And Bitcoin was one of the first forms of that, and decentralized finance is part of Web3. The idea behind it is straightforward. Instead of trade fi traditional finance where you have banks and large companies with a lot, a lot of people and very little tech, you don't only, and that's what fintechs are doing, like PayPal, for example, you don't only add software tech to it, you actually outsource the tech to blockchain. 
So you leave the people for those that you need them for, but the majority of the interaction, the majority of the platform gets put into a decentralized ecosystem where people have full transparency, they have this full trust, and they actually own their financial goods. Now, again, just like anything, it initially was used for very questionable use cases. And you may have actually heard about a scam or another in the DeFi space, in this case, the Squid Game scam that was based on, it had nothing to do with the very famous TV series. It was just based on that idea and it attracted a lot of attention. And it had this idea of an online gambling casino almost where people could get rich quick. And it happened what had to happen. And a lot of other people sadly lost a lot of money by running into that. But obviously, just like in Bitcoin, we have seen a transition and we're seeing very legit use cases popping up in the decentralized finance space. Doesn't matter if it's decentralized exchanges where you can actually exchange digital assets without having to trust anyone. There is no centralized party anymore. All the way to projects like DeFi Chain, where I'm also helping out, that is focusing on decentralized tokenization of stocks and many other forms. Here, the idea is that it allows people all over the world to get price exposure into things like Apple and into things like Tesla and so on. So the very important part here is that this is a completely new aspect of this entire financial world. Because here, you don't have to get access to your broker anymore. You can actually do this by the blockchain and you can completely control your asset. And for example, at the beginning of 2022, one, when there was this entire outcry about Wall Street bets and Robinhood, where Robinhood shut down the trading for a lot of stocks and people had this massive outcry. With decentralized tokens, this is not possible because people actually own their own asset. There are very more exciting topics in Web3. DAOs, as I mentioned at the beginning, non-fungible tokens, NFTs, the metaverse. DAOs, and this was my initial story, had this very bad reputation because it got hacked in 2016, supposedly by Toby Hernish. And that left a sour taste in many, many people going forward. Here, the idea is you have a decentralized autonomous organization that controls another asset. This can be gaming, this can be real estate, or these DAOs are probably gonna be a new form of companies where people don't have to set up a limited that then can be shut down or cannot be controlled in a decentralized manner. But here, this organization can completely run and control this group on the blockchain. And this is a very, very exciting topic at the moment. Another one that you have probably heard are non-fungible tokens. Here, you have a digital collectible. So somehow people transfer cards, gaming cards, stamps, into the digital space. And just like there are a lot of people who love to collect cards in the real world, you can now collect them digitally. Again, it starts off as a bit questionable and a bit weird. For example, at the moment, the most well-known NFTs are those of so-called bored apes. And uh, additionally, you have rocks that people love to collect. And they're even as crazy things as invisible rocks, which is nothing else than a white piece of a square that people pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for. Now, this is probably the more questionable side of the use case, but I can foresee already many, many exciting things when it comes to NFTs. Sneaker companies like Nike are looking into authenticity stamps when it comes about their shoes. You have access to various member clubs, access to movies, special screenings, and you have this authentic ownership display that for example, you were at the World Series or the World Champ Cup. And these are all things that are completely transforming how digital ownership is seen today. The latest big topic here is the metaverse, which combines Web3, so you owning digital assets with virtual reality. A lot of Web2 companies like Meta or X Facebook, Microsoft, Samsung are the ones who think that they can be disrupting Web 2 by transferring it into Web 3 and becoming the metaverse. I'm a bit skeptical about this. Not so much because we see a lot of questionable use cases in the metaverse. For example, by selling a $650,000 yacht that doesn't exist other than in your imagination, in this virtual reality. But it is more that 
we have never seen Web 1, so the internet providers, being big in Web 2. And I just don't see that these Web 2 companies will seriously be disabled to disrupt their own business model by giving up the ownership and transferring that ownership to the customers. But also in the metaverse, it's not so much about do we believe that Meta or Facebook can transform that. It's really more what are going to be those actual use cases. And I have been in the US just in the past week, and I talked to many, many companies there who are working in the metaverse. And we're seeing quite some exciting use cases when it comes to real estate, where there are virtual reality access points to real estate. We see this when it comes to meetings, when it comes to branding, Coca-Cola and many companies allow frameworks where you can then go and experience these ideas in a completely new manner. And that is what I think over the next 10 years can be a very exciting point here. I want to finish with one thought. We have talked about the history, a bit of the questionable use cases. We talked about the status quo. We talked about the future. And I want to leave you with a very exciting thought here. Imagine in a couple of years, you go to a coffee shop, to a local coffee shop, and it says there's trademarked coffee there, fair trade, and you can rely on that. Well, at the moment, you would just have to trust that. But let's imagine in the future, you can just pull out your smartphone or you just need your contact lenses. And you look at the little QR code and in instantly, immediately, you can see the entire history of that coffee. And you can see that indeed, this was produced by some wonderful coffee farmers in South America. And you can transparently see this. The exciting thing is, this is not a technology that only Starbucks could afford. This is what any mom and pop store can actually afford. And now you go and you make a coffee payment. And this coffee payment does not rely on a centralized party that takes a large cut out of this entire transaction, but it's extremely efficient, extremely fast. It doesn't need all those conversions. And the payment gets distributed and you can see this live over the various access points. You can see that there are smart contracts in the middle. You can maybe even see that these coffee farmers don't run a traditional company. They set up this virtual company called the DAO on the blockchain. You have these if-then statements where people don't have to trust each other as much as anymore for those payments. This allows completely new partners coming in that maybe don't have the track record in the past. It levels the playing field. And now imagine while you pay this, you leave a little tip, not only for the cashier, but for that very first person, those two coffee farmers in South America, because you appreciate them for their great service. And that is what I'm so excited about in Web3. Thank you.